Matt Aikens. I'm from the University of uh, Wisconsin. Um, so I'm here to give a little bit of a uh, summary on the sorghum forage management that was discussed in the uh, conference earlier. Um, so just a few key points we'll, we'll discuss here. So just the basics of uh, sorghum for forage management, um, really key things to look at is the type of sorghum sedan grass uh, you're thinking about using. Uh, different, uh, there's definitely several different types and traits to consider. Uh, planting conditions are really critical uh, in sorghum forages to uh, look at temperature, depth, soil type condition. And, um, seeding rate and method are also important and uh, slightly different between the different types of sorghum and sudan grass that you use. And, and fertility needs with any crop, you really need to consider what the fertility needs are for this. Um, and we'll discuss that a little bit. And then harvesting, it really the harvest management will dictate uh, what type, uh, what quality of forage and also the yield potential uh, for the sorghum, uh, sorghum forage. So there's three main types of sorghum uh, forages. So you have forage sorghum that's going to be uh, pretty similar to corn silage. It's going to be a moderate size, six to eight feet tall, typically a large grain head, a thick stalk, um, typically uh, managed in a single harvest system. Then you have uh, Sudan grass. It's a much thinner uh, stock type really adapted more to a multi-harvest system, uh, usually two or three cuts in the Midwest and probably Central Plains, uh, more adapted to a dry hay uh, or uh, baleage or uh, hay crop silage. And then you have sorghum sedan grass that's a bit more intermediate uh, uh, as far as the stem size, so it's a bit versatile, so you can use that as a multi-harvest crop where you take two or three cuttings for higher quality and protein or you can use it as a single harvest crop where you can let it uh, fully mature and take it off uh, for, um, to get higher yields and also higher fiber content and roughage. Um, within these, you have several different traits. So brown midrib is going to increase your fiber digestibility. And then you have photoperiod sensitive. Um, that's going to allow you to maximize your uh, yield of vegetative material because it's not going to mature until uh, mid to late September. And then Bercritic, Bercritic Dwarf is really uh, fairly useful, especially with forage sorghum, because the inner nodes are going to be shorter, uh, more leaf content. The big thing is it likely reduces your yield potential because it's a shorter stature crop. Uh, the male sterile uh, is going to trait is uh, fairly useful if you want to look for a, a high fiber uh, type crop that's not going to accumulate any starch in the grain. Uh, and then dry stock is going to be useful within all of these if you're looking at especially a single harvest system if you want to try to um, get that harvested when the moisture is at, uh, in the desirable range. And typically that's about two to five percent uh, lower moisture levels compared to a conventional type. Uh, really planting conditions are really critical in um, sorghum forages to uh, um, for for fast growth, so you want to make sure you're not putting them in um, low lowland areas where it's wet. So you want a fairly well-drained soils. Uh, temperature of the soil is really critical; it has to be at least 60 degrees, ideally, at least uh, ideally at 65 to really get a fast germination and fast initial growth to, to compete with weeds. Uh, they can be work; they can work pretty well in either no-till or uh, tilled situations, uh, based on our experience in Wisconsin. But planting depth is really something we got to monitor. It has to be between three quarters uh, to an inch uh, deep. Uh, if you get too deep, it's going to result in slow germination and competition with weeds. If you have sandier soils, uh, you can get a little bit deeper and have a little bit more, uh, not a, of an issue with emergence. Harvest management and feeding. Um, is, harvest management is really critical to kind of what what the desired uh, quality and yield potential is. So your multi-harvest crops uh, system is going to be, you're going to get a higher fiber digestibility and uh, uh, higher protein content. So that's going to be more focused on like lactating dairy cows and maybe for growing uh, beef cattle. Uh, typically we're going to see two harvest. Um, if we're going to plant in early to mid-June, which is probably typical in 
um, Nebraska, maybe a little bit earlier depending on your soil temperatures. You're going to take your first harvest in usually late July, about 45 days after planting, and then usually every 30 days thereafter depending on when you're going to get your first uh, frost. As far as a single harvest system, that's going to maximize the yield. Usually it's about two times the yield compared to a multi-harvest crop. Um, and as far as uh, this, it's going to be fairly similar to management of corn silage. Um, so you want that crop to mature up to usually uh, that soft dose stage of the berries. Um, and that usually at that stage, your moisture content is going to be fairly close to 30 to 40 percent uh, dry matter. In uh, most situations, it's going to dry down uh, at that point, but if you get a late planting or use photosensitive varieties, you might have to wait for a killing frost to allow those leaves to dry down and uh, wait, wait until the uh, crop's moisture content's at the uh, desirable range. Now there are some special considerations with sorghums, um, some, some toxin, toxicity issues. Uh, one is nitrates. Uh, that can happen either in a, a drought situation where the plant shuts down um, and then the uh, nitrates will accumulate because they're not being converted to proteins or during a frosting event where the, again, it's taking up nitrates but not converting them. Um, these accumulate in the lower part of the stalk, so what we can do is raise up the cutter bar a little bit in a single harvest system um, to try to reduce these. Um, the one thing to consider is nitrates do not dissipate especially after a frost um, because that plant is uh, basically is not active so then that the nitrates will stay in the plant material. Um, we want to try to, the silage fermentation can help with this a little bit but I would still recommend to have these tested because the test is fairly inexpensive and, uh, compared to the potential uh, cost of losing an animal. Uh, prussic acid is the other toxin that we uh, need to consider. Um, usually this happens in, uh, this can uh, accumulate in uh, usually young growth in the leaves material after a frost, uh, after the um, frosting event ruptures the cells and the uh, hydrogen cyanide, cyanide accumulates. Uh, if you do allow that leaf material to dry down, that, that uh, prussic acid will uh, dissipate from those leaves. Um, but if you do graze this, you do need to be, uh, be aware of this. This is usually the most, uh, this is the circumstance where you have the most uh, risk of um, animal losses under grazing. So you really need to be uh, watchful of this crop um, under grazing situations. And with that, that's the summary of, from our talk today. So if you have any questions, you can email me um, at msakins at wisc.edu.